We are in the home stretch of our series, All My Days. I'm hopeful that you have found this a blessing. I'm hopeful too that if you took a kit through which you could make your prayer beads to guide you through each of the petitions that are a part of a daily prayer life, that you have found it something that has helped center you more deeply into the nature of God and the Spirit the Holy Spirit that guides us each and every day. We conclude this series next week, but today we focus on that beautiful bead. It looks very much like what it is on the world, like a globe, and our focus for scripture this morning is on Psalm 67. Listen now to this word. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known upon earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen. A word of thanks for David Bingham standing in this pulpit last week in my absence. Um, I had the joy of being able to watch that on Facebook. And I knew if I said I need a tight 15, he'd give me 26. So that worked out about like I thought. But if you were unfamiliar with David's gift in that regard, um, David is uh, blessed with the gift to preach, and I am thankful that you had the chance to experience it. Last weekend, John and I spent time in Atlanta, Georgia to represent, of all things, St. John's before the whole of the denomination to talk about recovery ministry as we do it. We got a whole lot of questions and a whole lot of folks don't understand. And I, after a while, I almost wanted to say, y'all, it's just a Memphis thing. I don't know how this works in your community, but it, there is something about that. And we have a lot of interest, uh, folk who want to see this thing. They are most curious slash concerned about, now how is it that you do all of that in the sanctuary? Even eat? And I feel like uh, what, what our Lord says when someone says, can anything good come from any certain place? The answer is, come and see. So uh, we expect to have visitors along the way to come and learn by seeing how we do this. And uh, it, was, it was good to know that we were a part of that conversation across the whole of the church. And I hope you take in that some measure appropriately of pride, but opportunity that now sets before us to make a deeper witness around the questions of recovery. So think with me, if you will, as we think about the world, just within this last week, the eclipse occurred on time, as calculated. Hmm. Science. Who knew? The moon eclipsed the sun and in the zone of totality, the corona of the sun does a magical thing. For while all else is dark, there it is, 
even obscured, is the physical evidence that although the light may be blocked by that which is between us and the light source, the light has not nor will it be overcome. How many of you moved to the zone of totality last week? Oh, look at y'all, oh my gosh. Am I right? Is it? Yeah. So what is it, 2024? Hot Springs is where everybody needs to be next, okay. Or think with me, if you will, about the power of Hurricane Harvey churning up seemingly out of nothing, because usually you see these coming like a week away, but it got into the very warm waters of the Gulf Coast and went from nothing to category four just unbelievably quickly with a size and scope that is still and shall be felt for a long time. There's a satellite image you may have seen of Harvey that was set alongside the satellite image of Katrina. If you saw that, massive in scale. And God help us for all the ways that we are going to be needed to help our sisters and brothers along the affected areas. This week, Eclipse, Hurricane Harvey reports that the permafrost of Alaska, not quite so permanent anymore. Or an iceberg twice the size of Luxembourg has broken apart from the Antarctic ice shelf. Would that we could listen to what science is telling us about all that now. Would that we'd stop making every darn thing political and hear the world's painful cries. Our focus this morning as we think about our daily prayer life of all the things that we're called to prayer for that are deeply personal and intimate about us and about our network of care, about those we know and those we love and the situations that are affecting the dailiness of our living, that among the things we are also called to pray for is the world. I was mindful as I was thinking about that this week of my first awareness of the world as a boy. There were two sources. One was a globe. Did you have a globe as you grew up or have one now in your home? And another, which I didn't know it had a name until I was older and in school, and that's a map of the earth which science is not flat but round but if you take a round thing and flatten it out it distorts and so my first awareness of a flat version of the earth was what we in cartography <clears throat> know as a mercator projection and um, if you were as Nick Stockton in his article about this particular projection of the map that it was created by Mercator in 17, 1579, rather. And if you went to public school, he says, any time before 1991, this is the map projection that told you that Greenland was the size of Africa, Alaska was bigger than Brazil, and Antarctica was an infinite frozen nightmare. Right? And that's what you knew because that's what you saw. And the thing about it on a map is if you see it printed on a map, it must be so, right? So the concept of how does that work uh, gives some perspective after the fact. But my first awareness of the earth as something I'm on uh, is through a map projection, it's through a globe, and as a boy in the late 60s through the NASA program and watching spaceship Earth um, 
it is, uh, I, I know they didn't do it for me, but my birthday is July 20. Anybody know what happened on July 20, 1969, right? Uh, so I, I, uh, I feel pretty sure Neil Armstrong did that for me as a young child. And the Viking One landed on Mars on July 20, 1976. I'm telling you what, man, I should have been a, an astronaut or something. I've always felt an affinity uh, toward that. How is it that you come to engage the planet, the world? And what does that mean about the dailiness of our prayer life? I think fundamentally and very briefly, I just want to highlight a couple of things. I think one of the reasons that we're called to pray for the world is to help us be aware in as much as we have enumerated all of the concerns of our hearts about what we're going through or those we love and what they're going through, all the various petitions that we are guided by appropriately uh, through a series of prayers for those with whom we are in intimate relationships that a prayer for the world is to remind us to think and to pray beyond the centers of our own universes. It is to move us to consider places on the planet we've never been and never will be. It moves us to think about the totality of God's creation that is far beyond what you and I can see about the fullness of a planet that holds so many people, but not just people. We're playing, praying for the world. We're not just praying for all of God's people who are on it, but all that is made, all that exists, and all that at times and in many places on this planet is striving, even to the point of peril, to exist, to live, to be. To pray for the world is to move us to consider that the world, the world of God's making, the one spoken into existence by the very utterance of the words, let there be, that it is filled with signs and wonders. And it's also filled with evidences of our incapacity to steward it faithfully. There are floating in our oceans ungodly amounts of plastic that's got nowhere to go. And that now my understanding is that within the sea lanes of the, uh, ships almost have to factor where that is as if it was a landmass. Right? Really? Amazing to me. To pray for the world is to pray for the beauty of every hue and color of every child born. To admire the intriguing sounds of every language spoken, whether it is ours or not. To take in the beauty of all creation in places that amaze us how it can be so beautiful. Now, for those of you who stayed here in town and observed 93% of the eclipse, like myself, and as I noted, 93% an A, and I was good with that because I just could not get out and travel. There was, and I'm sure it's the same for those of you who went to places of totality, there was a, it was an amazing thing to be able to look at trees, the grass. There was a color different color scheme. Among the things eclipsed, it seemed to me, was something in the light spectrum that things looked differently than I'm conditioned to knowing how they look. I don't know what all that meant, but I was amazed by that which I walk with and live around and 
uh, all the time and don't pause for a moment to think about how magnificent a part of creation it is that when you look at it through a different lens, the lens of an eclipse, you are awed by, wow, that's amazingly beautiful. And is everything okay with this? Because it feels a little freaky as well. Some of us have places we like to go on this planet, places we have frequented. Perhaps it, it's a beach or a mountain. There are places on this planet that the late Marcus Borg refers to as thin places. Those places where it seems like the distance between earth and heaven are very, very thin. Perhaps you have visited such thin places where the assurance of God's power and yet God's love are so, so close and you take it as an act of inspiration and affirmation that you are a child of God. We pray for the world believing that it is the desire of every family, of every person at some level to live in peace and dignity. And we must, in this moment, though, confess that there, as true as all of that is, there is a spirit that exists that sees the grandness of the diversity of God's world not as blessing but as threat. There are parts of your community that you live in, that we live in here in this city, that we would prefer not to be a part of ours. And we are ever so tempted when we live in fear about that which is diverse, that which is not like me, to wall ourselves off. God forgive us. So in this moment, as you incorporate prayers for the world, there may be situations you know about happening that you want to lift up. And we need to pray for all the things that are happening in this world that are troubling. But the challenge for us this morning is to pray for the world beyond us to help us understand that there is so much more going on simultaneously in this world than what we're dealing with. That merits our prayer to move us to think beyond ourselves and to think of others. How then shall we go forward? We're pretty good in this church. We don't live um, as siloed as other congregations might. That's not a judgment. We have a sense of otherness. We embrace that. And yet, even within this church, there are challenges of places we need to push ourselves to look beyond who we are to someone else. So as we prepare to close this series, I want to invite you to think about what it is as you pray for the world. Because the last two parts of this series you're going to be very familiar with, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, okay? But any prayers that we're going to have that include Jesus and the Holy Spirit, Jesus is going to say, what are you going to do about the world in which you live? So there are things that we've talked about and that we have prayed about through the course of this series. Things that we've talked about, about difficult things that have happened in our community. There's a person in particular that we have talked about that Mimi brought to us coming out of the issues around the ICE raids some weeks ago. And almost as if we could hear her screaming down the hallway this week, we got news that 
Romanio, that to which she spoke, is now back home in Memphis. And there's a full story around that that is greater than needs to be told in this moment. Here's a, an opportunity where we prayed for someone who is not us. Prayed for one regardless of their status, but that there was a need for a move of, of some measure of hope and justice. And while we celebrate Hermanio's return to his family, and as Pastor Greg Diaz celebrates the return, there is the heavy burden that remains of those who were not given that opportunity. And so within the world we live in, the world for which we pray, the world we're glad and thankful to be a part of, there are moments and times that our prayers need to be shouts. Shouts that there could be a celebration of what makes us different, not fear of it. Because the truth is, the truth is, that song we learned as kids could not be more true than it is right now, that he's got the whole world in his hands. Sing it with me. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.